Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Um, I think it's a, a curse of designers that we have too many slides. And I think I have the exact number as far as. So here goes. This is the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design. We have been looking at ageing since 1991, and we've done over 150 projects with over 100 companies. Um, so we really believe that this is an area. Everything from tools that were led by eight-year-olds all the way down to you know, airport en environments for Terminal 5. Quite simply, what we do is, I think, two words, improving life. Big statement. Uh, let me try this. Oh, it's okay. It's all right, Stephen. I'll do it from here. So if we look at this, it's an obvious problem. And it's not because this woman's 80. It's because of this. 60 to 90 buttons. That's the choice that we have, and it would confuse any of us. One of our researchers created this, which is more of a design prototype than a finished product. But it collates the three remote controls into one place, and it only shows you the buttons that you need. So on the first remote, you only actually need one button. And this is what happened when we gave it back. So we, we say in design and ageing, and in, in inclusive design, that smile is what we design for. It's not just about the functional ability, as a gentleman said earlier, it is about emotion, it is about needs, it is about wants. And the role of the designer is evolving from being a maker and creator to being all of these other things as well. A thinker, facilitator, listener ethnographer and a business leader and design is very very well placed to help enable some of these challenges help address some of these challenges that we have around aging our philosophy is to really be age inclusive rather than age exclusive so by that we don't just design things that are sp specifically or only for older people it's inclusive of a spectrum of age so we like to think of age and ability as a spectrum I've slightly changed my presentation because instead of talking to you about eight myths of aging, I want to talk to you about the edges of aging. And this is really a pulling together of a lot of conversations, thoughts that I've been having recently. And oops, that's not the best next slide to come up when um, we talk about that. But I want to think about those things that we don't normally associate with aging such as when we hear the word sexuality, maybe this comes to mind. But an American study showed that, you know, age is on the left, percentage on the right. This is the percentage of people re who report, who say that they're still having sex. And it's probably under-reporting because, you know, someone in, in their 70s won't want to tell, you know, a young researcher with a clipboard exactly what they're doing. It's none of their business. And we made a mistake because it wasn't really about sexuality, it was about intimacy. And language is extremely important. And one of the things we wanted to do was to look at what sexuality, love, intimacy means for an older person. And this project with Age UK looks to be, sent two messages. One is about respecting your sex, the other is about protecting. Why protect? Because sexually transmitted infections are rising in the over 60s and dropping in the under 30s. Um, and, you know, many women that we spoke to in their 70s and 80s had never touched a condom because nice men don't have, have diseases. So there is something here about how people are actually living, what we think they're doing, and what they're actually doing. The message here is just saying love is love at every age and we wanted to create a textural rich design offering that a younger person would look at and say I want that. Now when I'm older this is something aspirational about age, it's not about reducing, reducing of functionality. And here are just some shots of how it may look on the under, London Underground. Incidentally London didn't take it up but New, New York did. 
technology, one of my bugbears, because I think I'm a closet geek inside. I'm wearing contact lens instead of glasses, but um, I'm still there. Um, engineer by training. This really shocked me. A study by Philips that says 13% of the American public believes that technology products are easy to use. That's a ridiculously low number. And you know, we do sort of things that, um, you know, this is a project with Sony, the video isn't going to work. Um, but it shows, it shows um, when, they, when you tilt the, the screen, the map actually comes up in relief. And the same thing with this. So what this was really looking at is how you bring attributes of the real world that people can read into the digital world. This was shown at the last Aging um, 2.0 uh, meeting, and it really looks at how familiar typologies such as books, diaries, etc., can help us learn technology. And this is being implemented by Samsung and Korea Telecom. And for us, when we talk to older people, you know, it's not just about a technology, it's about the important thing is social connection and personal independence. And when you have something like the rise of the virtual community, you know, all of you, including myself, tweeting at, and li on LinkedIn, Facebook, etc., you know, it feels like a video game. What does that number, 13,503, mean at the bottom? You know, do I, am I linked, it says I'm linked to that many people, am I really? And it really feels like, you know, it's about high scores. And some research that we've done really shows that older people are not looking to accumulate more relationships. They want to maintain and strengthen their existing relationships that they've built up over a lifetime. Sites sometimes, uh, you know, encourage weak online relationships, whereas older people want their online um, profile to mirror their real life as closely as possible. And there are dif difficulties, not just with the hardware and the software. You know, a new digital etiquette has to be learned. And here's someone who's posted how, how you should approach her um, if you want to be her Facebook friend. A new digital language, what does all that mean? Or that. Or that. You know, the, the little one at the top looks like he's stoned, and the one next to him looks like an axe murderer. And when we think of volunteerism, older people are not just the recipients. You know, in our design projects, we want to think of them as collaborators and authors, co-creators, not just test subjects or guinea pigs. And, you know, a good example of this is the Southwark Circle, um, in, in my opinion. Um, do have a look at their site, because it's not just younger people helping older people, it's everyone helping everyone. And it's something that they found out in their first couple of years of operation. Really good project. Social innovation. Well, most of the world is not like Halima. <laughs> Um, and social innovation means a different thing. And when you look at great ideas such as, you know, renting your neighbor's car and paying them by the hour, the life straw allows you to drink, um, you know, from a river in rural areas, or the laptop for every child uh, initiative. Where are the older people? You know, this is something that I really feel is missing. So hats off to you, Halima, for talking about those older people and social innovation in the same sentence. Finally, just want to talk about image and portrayal because we did an audit of literature for older people and a lot of it is like this. And this is, this is fairly old, but it's still kind of, um, it still holds true. You know, pictures of smiling older people, you know, their best friend is someone in a uniform. Um, this is imagery which pervades us, you know, pervades almost as much as the Google image. Or if not, it's this kind of thing, which I find, you know, one, on the one hand it's supposed to be funny, I actually find it quite disrespectful. So it's really going beyond stereotypes, you know, older people can use technology, they are interested. Um, and I love this image on the right by the artist Katrine Troutner because it just speaks of vitality, sensuality, desire and a love of life. And this was something um, from earlier this year from one of the UK national newspapers, but people in their 50s and 60s are more likely to succeed in a new business venture than those under 30. It's the rise of the elderpreneur. 
Um, you know, when we say entrepreneur, we think of Mark Zuckerberg, perhaps, you know, someone in their 20s. But actually, many older people are reinventing themselves into their 70s and 80s. So, to bring this finally to a close, and I'll just take a minute or two here, we, re we really need to radically rethink. And one of the things, you know, we've been talking to people like Halima about, Stephen, many of you in this room, um, is not just looking at functional need and that, that those sort of things that are immediate. Because if we struggle with dealing with people who are 65, what about when we're 75, 85, or 95? How does that impact something like health? Not just financially, but how do you manage personal health within your home, maintaining independence? How do we move from a medical model of aging, of healthcare and aging, to a social model, to a cultural model? How do we embrace all of those things? Wealth is another. If you're living to be those, those ages, how is wealth managed? You know, can you retire at 65? Should you retire at 65? Or should you retire at 35, look after your family, and then come back and work again? Relationships. If, at the moment, we celebrate marriages that last 50 years, what if a marriage is 80 years? How does, that, how does the uh, you know, five-generation or six-generation family look, especially if they all have to work in the same place? And you know, workplaces are an interesting subject because you have generally the older people in a company designing the space and the systems, and the younger people kind of contributing the technology, and there can be some real tensions there sometimes. Mobility, for a lot of older people, their world is within three kilometers of the home, and most journeys are made within that. How do we rethink that beyond the mobility scooter? And retirement, that great gift of the American corporate in the last century to get older people out of work and younger people into work. What happens when you retire at 65 and you have another 30 years of life? So that is the, the reason for the enigmatic title. In the last century, people hit 65 and maybe had another three years of life. In this century, we'll see another 30. And that's probably many of us sitting in this room. So it's really up to us to think about this now. And I find this really rewarding because people are surprising. Older people are gifted, intellectual, um, creative, experienced individuals. And we've never, ever done a design project that's gone the way we predicted. I want to say two final things. Desire does not fade away with age. Um, think of yourself, think of um, when you're older. And a very powerful phrase for um, some of our designers when thinking about someone who may be 50 years older than them, working with them, having to shut up and listen to them, having to give them the reins for a chance is this. That idea of designing for your future selves. So as I said before, I think many of us, some of us in this room, will have that extra 30 years. And I didn't want you to think I did um, a lot of this work all by myself, so this is the gang back home. And most of our projects are on our website. I didn't want to talk about them because you can go online and have a look and there's some great videos there. There's even two people sitting in the front who have done some great projects with us. So, thanks very much. Great.